Do it. The people you demand your thing. suffering. People always demand suffering. Okay, so uh, my theory topic today is what is to be done, specifically relating to Leninism and his ideas of the Vanguard Party. And um, just a little background, the text came out in 1902, um, it's Tsarist Russia, it's not a happy place to be living, and basically people are kind of divided on two camps, with the people who actually want to organize a revolution and overthrow the Tsar and institute socialist policies, or people who just kind of want to make things better and slightly more democratic and liberal, and that, to that extent. So I'll just go ahead and get started with uh, what I've prepared. Uh, what is to be done can be seen as achieving two goals. The first, a polemical onslaught against the opportunistic Marxist of the day, and the second, laying the foundational principles for a revolutionary party. Before I begin, I feel that it will be helpful to revisit some concepts of Marx and class theory. Then I will address the problem of the opportunists, and after that I will address the blueprint that Lenin lays for the Vanguard Party. Uh, to talk about class theory, capitalism can be described as a social relationship between two classes of people. This relationship is determined by, one's, by a person's uh, relationship to the means of production. These classes are the bourgeois class, who own the means of production, and the proletariat class, who own nothing. The proletariat, out of sheer necessity to exist in the world, must sell the physical and or the mental use of their bodies to the bourgeois class to obtain a wage so that they can purchase the food that they eat or pay the rent or the house that they sleep. Um, in the early days of capitalism, working conditions are egregious. Men, women, and even children are forced to work in factory conditions that were dangerous, filthy, or in excess of 10 hours a day. Uh, it was through these conditions that trade union consciousness is born. The struggle to improve working conditions found workers organizing themselves into unions to gain leverage over the capitalists. It is through the spontaneity of the working class that they find themselves engaged in struggles. However, taken, this is a quote from Lenin, and all my quotes will be coming from what is to be done, so you can find this text on Marxist.org if you would like to seek it out. I highly recommend it. Um, taken by themselves, these strikes were simply trade union struggles, not yet social democratic struggles. And when it, Lenin talks about social democratic policy, revolutionaries, and theory, what he really means is a communist, because in that day you couldn't really call yourself a communist uh, because it was outlawed. So you had to take more sorry, incognito of terms. So uh, they marked the awakening of antagonism between workers and employers, but the workers were not and could not be conscious of the irre irreconcilable antagonisms of the interests of the whole of the modern political and social system. It is the trade union struggles which the economists see as an opportunity to engage the workers. By helping the workers organize strikes to gain concrete results and improve the welfare of the other of the workers. Uh, the general problem that can be seen by engaging trade union struggles with the intent to improve working conditions is that it can be seen as simply addressing the symptoms and not the problem, the symptoms uh, of capitalism, as where capitalism is the problem. It is very common for the social democrats at this time and period, uh, which Lenin is writing, to simply, ex uh, the social democrats meaning the actual uh, trade unionists because there's kind of a break. A lot of people say, hey, we're social democrats, but really what they are is economists, or as we'll later find out, other things. Um, it is very common for this people in this time period, uh, where someone is writing to simply exempt Tsarist Russia as a fact of life. So the economist position is to try to make small reforms here and there, and to make things slightly better and more democratic. Um, Lenin speaks ill of this. Uh, another quote, since there can be no talk of an independent ideology formulated by the working masses themselves in the process of their movement, the only choice is, either bourgeois or socialist ideology. To belittle socialist ideology in any way, to turn aside from the slightest degree, means to strengthen bourgeois ideology. Trade unionism means the ideological enslavement of the workers by the bourgeoisie. Hence, our task, the, trade, the task of social democracy, is to combat spontaneity, to divert the working class movement from the spontaneous trade unionist strivings, to come out from under the wing of bourgeoisie, and to bring it under the wing of revolutionary social democracy. By engaging, and only engaging, the working class, the pursuit of economic struggles excludes all possibilities of other political struggles, as it is necessary to respond to the workers, that is, to be subservient to spontaneity of the workers of the trade union struggles. This is where the problem of econo ec economists lies, because they're responding to spontaneous uh, uprisings of the masses, but they're not trying to lead them towards anything past uh, Sorry, Russia. It's just, hey, your working conditions are terrible, so what you really need is to work maybe eight hours a day, 
or maybe you just need a raise. It's, it's never an attempt to actually seize the means of production and institute socialism and basically get rid of capitalism. And so uh, the, the term money actually kind of uses against these people, it says, you know what, you guys are the rear guard of the movement. You're always following the masses around trying to find out what they want rather than trying to lead them into socialism. Um, another form of opportunism seeks to create opportunities for itself uh, through the use of terror, that is, violent acts that are used as a means to shock people, they hope to make a situation in which the masses would be awakened from their everyday lives and join the struggle. Historically, these can be seen by groups like the Weather Underground, who use bombs to destroy symbols of capitalism as a means to shock people into paying attention in hopes that they would do something. Uh, that's something really they never clearly defined what really they wanted. Um, groups like the Situationists were determined to use a counter spectacle to awaken the masses into a revolutionary activity. Uh, being the fact that if you create something that's so shocking, they'll kind of be like, oh, what's going on? I don't know what I should be doing, or something to this effect, again. Um, we can even see terror being used today, but in a more toothless form against political celebrities. Uh, what happens is you see a lot of people get pied, uh, and when people throw pies, it's like, oh, well, that'll sure you know, raise another spectacle, and people will actually find out, why did this guy get pied, and want to do something about it. These are kind of problematic in their own rights. But uh, the problem here is that these acts of terror don't work. Furthermore, it is a way to avoid the real hard work that must necessarily be done in order to organize a successful revolution. The advocates of terror, sometimes referred to as propaganda by the deed, fail to realize the masses already find themselves acting spontaneously pursuing trade union struggles. Lenin is especially scornful of acts of terror. Advocates of terror, as a means for exciting the working class movement, and of giving it a strong impetus, uh, it is difficult to imagine an argument more thoroughly dis that disproves itself. Are there not enough outrages committed in Russian life without special excitants having to be invented? On the other hand, is it not obvious that those who are not and cannot be roused to excitement even by Russian tyranny will not stand by twiddling their thumbs and watch a handful of terrorists engage in a single combat with the government? And so um, Lyndon then goes on to basically ask this question, what is it that terrorists and economists actually have in common? And it's the fact that they're opportunists. The economists and the terrorists merely bow to different poles of spontaneity. The economists bow to the spontaneity of the labor movement, pure and simple, while the terrorists bow to the spontaneity of passionate indignation of intellectuals who lack the ability or opportunity to connect the revolutionary struggle and the working class movement as an integral whole. Uh, we can see this as truly common thread is the lack of organization, that is the theoretically advanced uh, members that maintain a party discipline and is able to work that uh, Sorry, my notes are a little scrambled. But it's to make real revolution happen. Uh, there's a mass movement based on the class interests of the proletariat. The economists seem content with becoming the rear guard to spawn any of the worker. The terrorists cannot bridge their gap with the insurrectionist intentions of with their insurrectionist intentions to incorporate the working class. Uh, another quote from Lenin: Political activity has its logic quite apart from the consciousness of those who, with the best intentions, either call for terror or for leading or, lead, or lending the economic struggle itself a political character. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. And in this case, good intentions cannot save one from being spontaneously drawn along the lines of least resistance. These methods have been proven to fail time and time again. We must understand this and not fall prey to the pitfalls of opportunis, opportunism and the subservience to spontaneity. Uh, another quote from Lenin, critics and economists are degrading social democracy to the level of trade unionism. And when the terrorists are strongly advocating for the adoption of tactics as a plan that repeats the old mistakes, and such a time to confine oneself to profundities of this kind means simply to issue oneself a certificate of mental poverty. Uh, now that we've discussed what is not to be done by revolutionaries, we can now discuss what should be done. Well, what is the correct path for social democrats to take? What does Lenin mean when he calls for a vanguard party? Lenin explicitly states that social democratic politics are, in fact, not trade union politics. When the workers get together to strike for better conditions, they are merely addressing the symptoms of capitalism. It is the goal of the revolutionaries to make a strategic intervention into these trade union politics and bring the workers' class consciousness. And as a quote, uh, class consciousness cannot be, brought, or cannot be, or can be brought to the workers only from without, that is only from outside the economic struggle, from outside the sphere of a relationship between workers and employers. Working class consciousness cannot, genuinely, cannot be genuine political consciousness Unless the workers are trained to respond to all cases of tyranny, oppression, violence, and abuse, no matter what class is affected. This means that the workers' struggle must not simply be towards bettering working conditions. 
It must be working to and working conditions for all. The other point that is being made here is that workers need to connect their emancipatory struggle uh, from the capitalists with the struggles of all oppressed classes, be this other workers in other factories or in other countries, or with oppressed minority groups. The revolutionary must always seek to progress the workers beyond trade union, uh, progress the workers beyond trade union struggles and revolution into revolutionary struggles. To do this, the revolutionaries must first organize themselves. This organization, the Vanguard Party, the Vanguard Party is itself made up of the most theoretically advanced members of the proletariat class. This is students who study Marx and can go out and teach people Marx. This is workers who can organize their factory. And when you find a worker that's really good at organizing his factory, what you don't want to leave him as is a worker in a factory. Uh, there's no sense in leaving him to spend his day working 11 hours in a factory when he could be out organizing other factories. So the intention of the Vanguard Party is to actually set these people up. Uh, it, it, an example some people might be familiar with, if you've read Malcolm X or kind of seen the movie, the Nation of Islam kind of did this, right? Malcolm X is supported by the Nation of Islam. What he does is he goes out and raises uh, awareness about Islam and race matters. But uh, uh, to be actually precise, what should have happened is he should have been organizing the classes of proletariat, not on the face of his interest of race and class, not race. So um, the social democratic politics, as opposed to the economists, the social democratic ideals should not be, trade, not be the trade union secretary, but the tribune of the people who is able to react to every manifestation of tyranny and oppression, no matter where it appears, no matter what stratum of class or people it affects, who is able to generalize all the manifestations and produce a single picture of police violence and capitalist exploitation, who is able to take advantage of every event, however small, in order to be set forth before all his socialist convictions and democratic demands, in order to clarify for all and everyone the world historic significance of the struggle for the emancipation of the proletariat. Now, uh, a lot of times people will say, oh, well, we've got to be kind of covert about this. We don't want to just out and out say we're a communist or anarchist. And then say, no, we have actual beliefs. We need to stand by our beliefs, and we need to fix the masses. So we're not simply trying to deceive them. Um, and Lenin actually, in, in contrast to social democratic politics, uh, uh, as opposed to the terrorist position, he writes, why do the Russian workers still manifest little revolutionary activity in response to the brutal treatment of the people by the police, the persecution of religious sects, the flogging of peasants, the outrageous censorship, the torture of soldiers, the persecution of the most innocent cultural undertakings, etc.? Is it because the economic struggle does not stimulate them to this? Because this such activity does not promise palpable results? Because it is little that it is positive? To adopt such an opinion, we repeat that it is merely to direct the charge where it does not belong, to blame the working masses for one's own philistinism, or as he puts it, Bernsteinism, which again is an economist position. Um, uh, we blame ourselves, our lagging behind the mass movement, for still uh, unable to organize sufficiently wide, striking, and rapid exposures of shameful outrages. And so what uh, the Vanguard Party does is it sets up workers and students, right, the people who pretty much have a good idea of what's going on, right, past just, oh, working conditions are terrible, but actually have a sort of structural analysis of capital to say, look, you're part of a class of people who don't own anything, you have to sell your labor, and what the boss does is they exploit your labor. And you can see this as being, uh, I mean, as he puts it, uh, when he's talking, actually I'll just read, he's talking on agitation and uh, what the goal of agitation should be and as, as well as propaganda. Um, hitherto we've thought, with Plankinov, Plankinov being one of the original uh, Russians who brought Marxism to Russia, translated it, but um, he's basically discussing what Plankinov's view was. With Blankenoff, um, and with all the leaders of the international working class movement, that the propagandists dealing with, say, the question of unemployment must explain the capitalistic nature of crises, the cause of their inevitable and the inevitability in modern society, the necessity of the transformation of society into a socialist society, etc. In a word, he must represent many ideas, so many indeed, that they will be understood as an integral whole and must only by a comparatively few persons. The agitator, however, speaking on the same subject, will take as an, illus uh, an illustration a fact that is most glaring and most widely known to his audience, say the death of unemployed families from the starvation, the growing impoverishment, etc. And utilizing this fact, known to all, will direct his efforts to presenting a single idea to the masses. For example, the senselessness of the contradiction between the increase of wealth and the increase of poverty. 
He will strive to rouse discontent and indignation among the masses for crying out for injustice, leaving a more complete explanation of the contradiction to the propagandist. Consequently, the propagandist operates chiefly by means of the printed word, the agitator by means of the spoken word. The propagandist requires qualities different from those of the agitator. And in another quote, the propagandist does the same thing in periodical press that the agitator does in public speeches. And so you have a distinction between people who are actually writing for papers, who are doing theory work and trying to express broader ideas, and the people who are just agitating among the masses and saying, look, these work conditions are terrible, but it's a result of the boss because he hoards all the money. And uh, the reason people are starving to death is so we can have a boss who hoards all the money. So the goal of the revolutionaries is to simply organize the Vanguard Party of the most theoretically advanced members. Those members are to become professional revolutionaries whose full-time work is revolutionary work. This means to organize the proletariat to begin agitating, to begin writing propaganda. Their work, must, their work is to make a revolution happen. When a worker is unable to organize his workplace, he should not, or when a, sorry, when a worker is able to organize his workplace, he should not be left in his workplace a total for eight hours a day. He needs material support of the Vanguard Party to make it so that he can organize and agitate for eight hours a day. The Vanguard is not an elitist club of enlightened intellectuals who are merely there to give orders because they have the truth and the workers are not able to comprehend such complexities such as Marxism. On the contrary, the Vanguard Party and the revolutionaries that make up its membership must have faith in the people that the people are smart enough to get it and that they are more, uh, more interested in justice rather than simply their own self-interest or just you know, getting that extra dollar. And uh, I really, I mean, that's the extent of my notes, but I guess uh, I can fix any loose ends on the discussion. So, thank you. Um, <clears throat> there's several things that might be said, uh, Greg might help this question more better, but what I would say is um, they probably didn't read Marx close enough that they didn't declare themselves a Leninist, because if you read, if you read Marx <laughs> and you read Lenin, um, Lenin is basically teasing out a lot of ideas that Marx and Engels wrote, such as uh, having the communists be of the proletariat and organizing the proletariat, right? This is in the Communist Manifesto. And so a lot of people kind of take this divergence towards, oh, well, actually, let's go back and look at early Marx, because he was more of a humanist, and he had more better ideas, this notion of alienation, and we need to start approaching these rather than actually, you know, legitimate political work. And uh, do you have other ideas? Um, actually, you'll probably get a good answer in my lecture. The main reason why people declare themselves Marxists instead of marxist leninists is because of the Kronstadt. And what they feel is they feel that Leninism and the vanguard party that it advocates is too hierarchical, too rigid, too structural. And so they view any approach like that as doomed to end in a tyranny in their hyperbolic way, worse than capitalism. And that's what I've always assumed. That's why I wondered, but I'm not nearly as um, aware as Marx's sentences, unfortunately, or Marx in general. But so, um, where does that criticism come? Because after hearing what Lenin's words from, from Chris, um, it sounds like uh, like they, that he was dedicated to the idea of it not being there. So where does that criticism arise? Is it actually an, an actual playing out to come to be so? Yeah. Because that's what I. That's what I. Well, there there are two main criticisms that come from, uh, or, or, or two main left communist approach or criticisms of Lenin that play themselves out. Um, one actually precedes the Soviet Union, um, which is the Luxembourgian uh, left communist from Germany, um, which then gets taken up by, for example, the Italian left and right, the, the ultra leftists in Europe. And their criticism is this, look, you can have a party or, what, or some sort of organization, but as a matter of fact, what needs to happen is there's going to be uh, an uprising. And you can't control an uprising. You can't start an uprising. Uprisings just happen. And all those uprisings basically have to come from the workers. And if they don't come from the workers, 
then what's going to happen is they're going to be easily crushed or easily destroyed. And so any attempt to give any formal structure to these uprisings is ultimately a fruitless task. And so this is one of Luxembourg's core criticisms of, of Lenin. Um, the other left communist uh, criticism of Lenin is that the very act of having a vanguard differentiates yourself from the workers, qua workers. And so what it leads to is it leads to this uh, extra alienation between the workers and their political organ. And so it, if it ever has any success at all, it's going to just lead to this alienated, totalitarian, oppressive, you know, destructive, horrible, awful thing. Um, and this was actually mainly a, a, a criticism leveled by actually the economists. Right? Because the economists were very workerist in their ideology. If you didn't come from a factory worker, if you weren't a factory worker or your parents weren't factory workers, then you couldn't really be a communist. Um, and so their idea was, if you're not a worker, you don't really know what it's like, and therefore any, any politics that aren't directly involved with the workers, qua workers, are doomed to, to alienation of other. And so that would be there. Those are the two yeah, and the, the point is a lot of people try to divorce themselves from Lenin because a lot of people say, oh, well, Leninism was really, maybe it was okay, but what it really leads to is Stalinism, and we don't want Stalinism because that was just terrible. And so it's, it's a quick move to distance themselves. And actually, you'll notice it develops other strains of thought, uh, which usually gets pegged as Marxian rather than Marxist. Uh, you can see this in the Frankfurt School with people like uh, Adorno and Marcuse basically make criticisms and say, look, uh, all, all the Soviet Union really was just state capitalism. And so uh, it's, it's kind of a doomed project, and it's not really going to work out to liberate the people in the ways we really expected. And so really, we should avoid Leninism. And, and again, somebody like the board is going to say, look, you revolutionaries, you just need to realize you can't use alienated forms to fight alienation. And again, it goes back to this notion of what you're bringing up as far as, oh, well, there's a hierarchy of people who are above everybody else and giving orders. And again, Lenin's pretty specific. It's, it's not simply this elitist class of people who begin giving orders. It's people coming from the working class and people coming from schools and other intellectuals, and they're working together. And granted, uh, he, makes, he makes a pretty important distinction. He, he says, look, um, there's going to be some people that you can basically uh, progress and become agitators. Other people, they're going to do work too. They're going to hand out pamphlets because it's all needs to be done. It's not simply a course of what we need is just to have uh, one person deciding everything. Okay, so what, like, why would, why, would, if I understand correctly, like, um, there's like Hart and Negri would not identify as Marxist right? No, absolutely. And I have Okay, and so I, I, my introduction to their philosophy is is not substantial, and so why, why do they, why do they declare themselves so? Like. Because I'm assuming that their reasons would be different than the two that you just... Well, one of the reasons, my, my rudimentary understanding of Hart and Negri is the fact that they think that uh, worker struggles, like the actual class interest of the proletariat, has spread to other areas, right? And so we need to concern ourselves with all exploitation everywhere. And to be fair, I mean, this is covered in Leninism, like when, when working class individuals, like their consciousness, if it doesn't exceed to political consciousness, which is to say they're concerned about police brutality when Oscar Grant gets shot in, in Oakland, they should be striking in protest of police brutality. Or when uh, women are being oppressed somewhere for working conditions, all, all factories all around them need to be striking in support and solidarity to other workers. But where Lenin, or sorry, Hart and Negri seem to take it is, look, uh, there's exploitation everywhere. And so as long as you're resisting in your own sort of way, regardless of who you connect with, mm -hmm. then you're, you're kind of your own okay. revolutionary. Like the, the diversity of movements as opposed to one singular. Right. Movement. They basically think that every there needs to be this massive multitude coming together and striking. And another thing they pick up on is it's it's sort of this critique of, well, um, material factory conditions. It's not so like industrial 1840s where Engels is writing on working conditions. And I, and I, 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 yeah, I'm familiar with that a little. Right. So it's more this, this pursuit of intellectual property and they kind of Kind of yeah. basically just try to encompass every every act of resisting exploitation becomes some sort of revolutionary act for them. If it's the person who's not shopping at Walmart, they're a revolutionary. But you have anything? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Um, 
Um, well, actually, a lot of Hardin angry goes back to the second criticism, right? The Leninist vanguard, right, to the left comms is this alienated, separated thing, right, above and beyond the people. Well, basically, Negri and Hart just take a very theoretical um, approach to this. And you can notice this especially in their discussion between imminence, right, which is something that occurs inside of it uh, and arises out of it naturally, and transcendence, right? For them, the, the Revolutionary Party is a transcendent one, um, and so ergo back, right? It's alienating, it's just a reproduction of the state, whereas theoretically, right, the imminence of Spinoza right, is the multitude, right, that just resists imminently. So when you fire a share, you just, you're just doing something imminently out of yourself to resist capital, as opposed to a transcendent struggle for a party or state. Does that make sense? Okay. Thanks. Um, oh. God, just on that, though, as far as I know, they don't specifically attack. <coughs> they, they, don't, they don't make a reading of like and critique Lenin. Oh, well, yeah, it's and I, yeah, I'm sure that they appreciate that. They, I think it would be more Leninist to take exception to their, uh, the naivety of their approach than, I, I mean, I think they, they don't, they're, they're not Leninists, and they, they just, they don't really take a strong look at anything and, and really look critically at it at all. Well, have you read, have you read? Yeah. Um, I, I guess I would. I appreciate your comment. I guess I would, I would disagree with that, but I, I appreciate it. Um, Do you have a response? Oh, well, I mean, part of, they make big critiques, right? The Len, Lenin is basically tied up to Lenin, state, God, transcendent, right? And so they just view the critique of transcendence as a critique of the state, and a critique of the state as ergo a critique of the Lenin's vanguard. But I, I think, what the, what Kenny's saying is that there's not like a Negri and Hart book on Lenin. Yeah, oh, or in Empire, they they're not they don't have a section where they okay. where they I make a big point about what was so wrong about Lenin um, and what he did okay. or anything like that. And, and, and leave it alone. And, and to be and to to their defense, right? I mean, who in this age and day is a Leninist, right? Everyone knows that Leninism is repudiated and terrible, and we should all avoid it or we'll get right. Stalinism. Right. Um, except, of course, right, for me, and I, and I guess Chris, and Kenny, and theoretically, Badiou, Alain Badiou, and Zizek. Um, and so I, I think a good way to think about it is it breaks down into two camps. It has and that's in volleyball. And that's in volleyball. Okay. Um, but it breaks down into two camps. You have Negri and Hart, who embody historically the progression of the Italian autonomous, of Rosa Luxemburg, of Emma Goldman, all those things. Anarchistic, um, but this sort of left com uh, or left communist, sorry, I should use the majority, uh, left communist impulse, and then you have Alain Badiou, you have Zizek, you, uh, who who carry out this sort of Leninist or Maoist um, sort of tradition, and those are sort of the main two traditions in the left. Yeah, they do it more by re choosing Rosa Luxemburg. They choose. They they talk about her. They don't talk about. Her. Actually, there's another criticism that comes against Leninism. And it's from Michael Albert, who develops, he's basically, he developed Paracon, which is a sort of like post capitalist, oh, if we just all move to this direction where we have, a, his basic conception is that we need to get rid of division of labor and we need to get rid of bosses and basically have some sort of collective uh, place where we do our labor, but it's not alienating because we have valid strong complexes and other things like this. It, it, it's a purely utopian project from a Marxist perspective. But <clears throat> what his main critique of Leninism is, is he sees not two classes, but he sees a third class. He sees a class of, there's still bourgeoisie and proletariat, right, owners and workers. But he sees like a third class in there, which is what he calls the coordinator class. And he says, look, uh, these, this coordinator class, these are people like doctors and lawyers, and basically anybody who uses any type of specialized skill to gain like uh, a really nice position in capital, but also they have some sort of power. Uh, to kind of fluctuate and progress people like, like teachers in a university can pass and fail students. So they, they, have, they have power in their own right based on their social position. And what he basically argues is, look, Leninism, all it wants to do is take over the coordinator class and begin giving out orders and telling people what to do. And his, his whole project is, well, if, if we're not going to get a bit of division of labor, it's the same as saying, well, why should we... He basically makes this thing, he's like, look, if I was going to stand up here and say what we need is a big sexist movement to oppress women, but also we need to fight for capital operation, nobody would take me seriously. 
So when the Leninists go on the approach of, oh, what we need to have is uh, division of labor still, then why should we take the Leninists seriously? Which, to be fair, I, I don't think Lenin ever makes that claim that we should keep division of labor. Uh, as far as socialism, yeah, I mean, it's a transitory stage. What most people don't ever realize is that all Marxist Leninism is, is a stepping stone for, uh, to get to socialism, which can then go to communism. So, it's a strategy. I'm curious, I remember uh, from, from the introduction to that book, the compilation of all the different works of Lenin that you guys recommended, mm -hmm. it, the, the fellow who wrote the introduction, he says that, it, that towards the end of his life, Lenin kind of looked back and regretted how things turned out to some degree. And because the introduction was pretty short, and I don't you know, know that much about Lenin's life, I didn't know like exactly what he was referring to. But um, it, it seemed, and again, correct me, that maybe that regret that Lenin had at the end of his life about how things turned out had somewhat to do with how authoritarian, how authoritarian things have become. Because one thing I noticed about what is to be done is that he talks a lot about having to do things in secret, about having things very centralized which um, is quite reasonable, like you said, if you're living under a police state, you know, you can't, um, uh, you know, he mentions, um, you, you know, you can't have tons of newspapers where people don't really know what they're doing, they're out passing out, um, you know, these revolutionary newspapers, and the police can easily get your subscription list and go and arrest everybody that, you know, is on the list. So there's some really pragmatic reasons why in living under a police state, if you're trying to organize a revolution, you need to do things in a pretty secretive, centralized and maybe authoritarian way. But it, again, it just seems like that method of doing things continued and got worse under Stalin, etc. So was that something that Lenin kind of regretted or did I kind of miss there's, that wrong? There's two things that really respond on this, right? So for the Vanguard Party itself, Lenin advocates for a position that's called democratic centralism. And ostensibly the idea is that everybody gets to have a say in the policies that we're going to be forwarding. And once we take a vote on it and we decide, we're held to those which is the centralism part, right? You're, you're held accountable for your position or the things, the tasks that you're divvied out to. So if your task is to go to agitate for that day and you're going to go agitate, then you're going to have problems with Vanguard. So that's sort of more authoritarian in that respect. The second, uh, the notion, right, Leninism leading to Stalinism, um, is, some of us will say Stalinism is more than Marxist Leninism in practice. Uh, Sorry, say that again, that Stalinism? Is nothing more than Marxist Leninism in practice. Uh, this is to say, basically, uh, Lenin's other work, which is recommended as State and Revolution, and in it he talks about what does the revolutionary state do. For a state for Lenin, it's, it's simply used by one class to oppress another class. So in Tsarist Russia, the state is used to oppress all the workers and keep everything really crappy for everybody, while the Tsar obviously maintains his dynasty. Uh, in capitalism today, there's no, I mean, the, the state, when it makes laws, it doesn't make laws in favor of workers, it doesn't help them out and give them health insurance. It doesn't allow them to unionize. You have to actually appeal for these sort of laws, and they're pretty easily shot down. So the state itself, and what Lenin, the goal of the Vanguard Party, seizing the state for the revolutionary purposes, is to flip that relationship. So instead, it's the workers suppressing out all of the bourgeoisie class and getting rid of all the workers and this sort of thing. So, follow up there. Um, uh, but as I was reading that, especially, I mean, in a lot of ways, in, in what is to be done, Lenin sounded a little bit like an anarchist, at least in terms of his criticisms of the police beating people up and, you know, the, the different atrocities that the, that the state apparatus commit against people. Mm -hmm. It's rather than just being worried about, you know, just can we, you know, raise our wage by a dollar or whatever. And, um, but then again, it just seems like in the Soviet Union, again, my knowledge of the history isn't really all that great, but it seems like all those things that the Tsar did in terms of having a police state um, and, and having a lot of political oppression, it seems like that was recreated in the Soviet Union, where instead of the Tsar's uh, police, you have the KGB or all these other things. So it just seems like if, if you do have that state, even though it's meant to be transitory and it would be gone, once there's kind of bureaucratic class that does have a lot of power, how would they ever give that up, you know what I mean? Just like capitalists don't give up power and wealth voluntarily, why would this bureaucratic class that controls the state apparatus and has power and authority, why would they give that up voluntarily so that there would eventually not be a state moving on? Well, there's two things to say. Oh, actually, there's several things, but, right, so the whole Stalinist era, lots of purges, lots of collectivization, most of the purges that took place were against the bureaucratic class. People in the Central Committee oftentimes were routinely purged. 
And the reason is, is because it's a dictatorship of the proletariat. So when the people say, look, these bureaucrats, they're not doing anything productive for us. Uh, they're, in fact, hindering the revolution. Uh, we need to get rid of them. And so they get purged from the party. So, I mean, there's that. I, Greg, you want to? Well, I, I think to, to, to deal with this, there's, there's three things that need to be said about uh, Lenin's regret. One is, uh, I think Chris is exactly right. Um, uh, the state for Lenin, right, is for the suppression of one class by another. Well, here's the thing. If you have a proletarian state, and you're suppressing the bourgeois, right, slowly but surely, right, you'll, in theory, have less and less bourgeois, right, which means that state repression will eventually grow less and less and less. This is what's known in a technical term by Leninism as withering of the state. Um, so this is what Lenin wanted. And in fact, um, part, of the, part of the political bitterness of Lenin was that he didn't see the state withering. It's not so much that you know, Lenin is sad that, oh, you know, I had a vanguard and it was really centralized, and then also we had the Red Army and we had to suppress, you know, a bunch of czarists and the White Army and the Black Hundreds and the Black Anarchist Army. What the problem was is he had a stroke. He was basically removed from political life where he could watch it, but he couldn't affect it. And so, especially, I, I would really recommend reading Lenin's Testament, right? Like, here we have Last Will and Testament, but of course, Right? It's just a testament there because you don't have a, a will because you're not a political actor. But in any case, right, he leaves this testament, and what he advocates is for massive expansion of the CC, uh, a massive shakeup of the both, the CC? Oh, uh, sorry, the Central Committee, which is the main legislative body. He calls for a massive expansion of that, massive inclusion of especially working class people into the CC, and a lessening of the power of um, what you would call the bureaucratic class, right? The party officials. Um, and because he didn't see it moving in this direction, because he thought that, personally, he thought that most of the danger was over. None of the other people in the Bolshevik party, at the top of the Bolshevik party, thought that the danger was over, or anywhere close to being over, right? So Lenin's like, look, danger's over, bourgeois are mostly suppressed, now we can start withering the state. Everyone else is like, no, we're encircled by enemies. They want to destroy us, and they'll use any means to destroy us. What we need is to maintain the state to defend us. And so this political bitterness right, is because ultimately a lot of his, all, the withering didn't happen. And it didn't happen because all of these other people who were, by my lights, good Leninists, including Trotsky, right, viewed the Soviet Union in a real danger. Um, and so I think that was their mistake. <coughs> But this would, would account for the political um, bitterness. Does that, does that make sense? The second thing is huge amounts of personal bitterness. Um, Lenin was not initially a main figure in Russian uh, communism or world communism. That was Plenkinov, who is the father of Marxism. And Russian Marxism. Russian Marxism. Uh, obviously, Marx being the, the head of Marxists. Um, but uh, he brought Marxism to Russia. And eventually started taking an economist line. And Lenin, who was best friends with Plankinov and Martov and all of these Russian uh, revolutionaries, was forced to make a radical break with them and publicly, politically attack them <coughs> in every sort of way. Right? Because even though they were his friends, he viewed them as taking a wrong political line. So he basically alienated most of his teachers, uh, most of the people that he knew and he liked and loved and cared and worked with. And then also, he was a revolutionary, as was Karl Fatusi, who, again, inherited the text from Engels, I believe. Uh, it went Marx, Engels, and then it was either Bernstein or Kaczewski, or it was just Kaczewski, right? And this is, this is the main guy of Marxism at the time. The head, right? Every Marxist thinks of Karl Kaczewski at this time as the bastion and light of Marxism. And Lenin, because he's taking a radically different stance and is fighting for Marxism in Russia, has to write, again, against the head. It'd be like having to write how sucky a basketball player Michael Jordan is, right? But this guy who has supported and propped up the international communist movement, Lenin has to write the work, right? Uh, Marxism and the renegade Karl Kaczewski. And viciously, but accurately and polemically, attack all of the people who have been the lights and bastion of Marxism through all of these dark times. And so, right, so one is about a, polit a theoretical political matter, but another is just the theoretical and political actions Lenin had to take to ensure the success of 
the Bolshevik Revolution. Does that also make sense? Mm -hmm. so. Is it is it widely agreed that Marx is one of the main Stalinism? Because it sounds like I mean. Like, I hear that, and I immediately have a problem with it, but I know others might not. But so I would, I would like to know, is that that's, that would be debatable, right? Yeah, that, that's that's right. Well, it, it was, Stalinism. yeah, I mean, Greg, has, I Greg <laughs> has his own views on that. But I mean, if you situate the Soviet Union historically in its material conditions, right, where you have the West constantly aggressing and aggravating it, and basically there's never an opportunity to actually dissolve the state I mean, it's arguable maybe after World War II, right? That's where most good Marxist learners say, look, Stalin should have done it after then. But I mean, again, when you have Europe going to shit during World War II, and Hitler basically started to eat up nations and expand, uh, it's pretty good to have a state around that can actually organize the Red Army to actually combat fascism, right? If you want, if you want to know who, if, oftentimes people are like, oh yeah, D-Day was really awesome because they got in and they stopped uh, Nazis and fascism. No, it's, it's the Battle of Stalingrad, the Battle of Kursk. Uh, and it's through these key battles that Hitler's uh, armory and army was to completely destroyed. And beyond that, they didn't have an air force or naval reserves. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to give Stalin props on stopping Hitler. And so... Okay, but, I, yeah, but... So the point being is there was never really an opportunity. As long as, basically, it's a, it's, it was its own socialist state and for its own time period. And there was really never any allies for them. They just had to do it on their own. And what they really wanted to do was simply build socialism in their own country. They didn't really want to try to expand. It was just. Well, I guess, I mean, to clarify, I'm just one of you made the statement that Marxist Leninism, like, sort of inevitably leads to Stalinism. And I would, I would assume that a lot of Marxist Leninists would have a problem with that statement. Uh, do you want to That's what I would mean. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll be clear. I'm an anti revisionist. This is my position, right? So I'm an anti revisionist. Marx. Angles, Lenin, Stalin, math. Well, or watch it if you're one of those. But in any case, um, but Trotskyists, Trotskyists view themselves as Marxist Leninists and also are anti Stalinists. And then there's also non defined Marxist Leninists who generally don't support Stalin. But yeah, so uh, there is a clarification. There's debate on whether or not Stalin was a good Marxist Leninist. Okay. The Trotskyists especially disagree. But, okay. Does that? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the point to be is, look, if there's going to be a state, right, which is a dictatorship, but it's a dictatorship of the proletariat. And what that dictatorship does is it serves as a in a time of emergency to basically, uh, it, essentially what I want to say is this. There's no off switch to capitalism. There has to be a transitive state. You can't just say state off, capital off, and voila, we're done. There needs to be a transition period. And so that's what the dictatorship but, of the proletariat yeah, is. Well, it's the transition Okay, I can see your face. I would disagree. Sorry, we can that's, move on. That's, that's fine. I, I would recommend there's there's actually a lecture on the YouTube. Okay. There's a lecture on the YouTube channel on Stalinism if you want to learn more. Rob, Leninism from previous lectures I've gathered has a very hardline militant sort of nature, where it says any enemies outside, any enemies inside, we purge and we get rid of, and we do what we need to to get rid of and defend ourselves and make sure we survive. And with that being a part of what I've got is that an actual fundamental part of Leninist views? Um, so I, can, I can speak from what is to be done. Um, a lot of times what Lenin will say is, look, you have a lot of times, he, he goes over this as the freedom of criticism, right? It's pretty much the very first part. And he says, look, uh, if, if you guys have criticisms of the party and the directions we're going, they should be constructive criticisms. They shouldn't just be trying to slander the party and devolve into trade union politics. Are basically, and you know, he makes this big point. He's like, look, uh, he has this famous, like, oh, we are traveling in a marsh, we're holding hands, and, but there's people trying to drag us into the marsh, and we're trying to fight against that. So you're free uh, to criticize, but also you should be free to let go of us and not drag us down with you. But as far as political uh, purges, do you want to? Well, I, I mean, I'm referring more to the violent purges and the executions, the things that people view more as the Stalinist, more as the. Uh, Problematic well, do you this want to do the terror of 1919? Or? This is an incredibly po problematic position. This is my position, um, but it should be clear. Uh, where plenty of Marxist Leninists disagree with me. Um, Lenin advocates for purges of the party. It doesn't necessarily entail purges in a violent fashion, theoretically. 
right? It's possible, theoretically, to purge the party without that ending up in violent purges. So that, that would be the traditional, the traditional as in from 1960 on Leninist response. Okay, so otherwise the Leninists from 1960 on are mostly going to say, well, we still believe that we should do purges, we just don't believe that we should do them in a violent, mass purging sort of way. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, Le Leninists at the time also would say that. But I think if we're honest, because of the experience of Leninism, we can recognize if you're willing to purge from the party, which I believe is necessary, then it, it, not inevitably, but as a matter of fact, seems to lead to violent purges. As what? Um, well, the reason why is if you're building a political project of any variety and people are trying to destroy it, um, you either have to abandon that political project or defend it. Now, if you're trying to, so, so again, conceptually there's no problem, right? Because if you're trying to build a political party, by purging people, you can just remove them quite gently from the party. However, if people are using force to destroy that political project, you're once again confronted with an option. Abandon the political project or take the means necessary to defend it. At no point do I think communism will ever instantate under capitalism in which capitalism is not violently trying to destroy it. And Leninism is not willing to abandon the political project of communism. So its ability to purge right, becomes the ability to meet like with like. Does that make sense? Kind of, but when we're saying attack with force, that's something that really has to be defined for me. With a lot of what happened in the era of Stalin, what seemed to be the case was individuals who were uh, a member of the army under um, Trotsky were being executed, and uh -huh. uh, people who were part of these different groups who were not attacking physically, sometimes politically were opposing, sometimes uh, were accused of potentially violently opposing. These people were also purged and in some cases summarily executed. So what is the Leninist defense of that? Um, there's one thing to say. Um, when Trotsky abandons, and he basically gets exiled, right? Um, he ends up in Mexico. What he does is he begins viciously attacking the Soviet Union. And Trotsky organized the Red Army for the counter, basically to protect the Soviet Union from the counter-revolutionaries and the white Russians. And so he has pretty close ties to the generals at the time. And so one of the big fears is Bonapartism, right, where Napoleon Bonaparte comes in, this military leader, and kind of just co-ops the revolution and takes it his own way. And so one of the big fears Stalin has is, look, Trotsky's openly denouncing the Soviet Union and attacking us. Um, he is pretty good and close to the generals, and so what we need to now do is purge the generals. Well, and I understand purging the generals. I understand removing them from position. I don't understand execute. Do you? Um, here, here's the thing. Uh, I would recommend... This is a historical question, which, I mean, not to criticize, it goes a little far afield of what is to be done. Um, the only answer that you're going to find is an answer in history. Uh, but just as sort of anecdotal evidence, I would look at Latin America, at what happens when civilian leaders imprison popular generals, and how often those generals stay in those prisons, and how often those generals leave those prisons and execute the civilian government and institute a military quanta. Or stay exiled. Latin America is a bit different. Well, Chile right. specifically is a bit different. Could we say that? Could, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, could we say that if he, okay, so we kill General da da da, but the powers that be that want what power, the, that General so and so is going to do, mm -hmm. couldn't they just take another guy? You're, you know what I'm saying? Yes, you are absolutely right. Right. So, what's the solution to that? 
the the purges. Purges. purge all the generals, <laughs> yeah, yeah. which is exactly <laughs> what happened. Yeah. You'll notice, right? Okay. Every, yeah, yeah, there's a there's double standard in Leninism here because Lenin is advocating it as what is to be done to take the hard route to not assume that you can just do something violent and explosive and get it all done with and not have a risk or a problem that you have to work hard to do things that are more difficult, challenging, and that require more persistence. Well, I see these purges, the violent purges more specifically, as being taking the easy way out in the hopes of simplifying matters and getting a spontaneous solution. I mean, you could get a better prison system or something in exile that's you know, more actually confining and that prevents things like what happened last night. Do you want to give a response, Greg, and take the next question? Um, I, I would say two things. One is this, this is something that often happens with the Soviet Union, so I'm going to issue this challenge to you. Um, and then I'm going to give a response to the challenge. Uh, <laughs> but it's very easy to say the purges in the Soviet Union. But of course, my question to you would be, what purges when and for what? Um, and unless you can answer that, right, it, there's no rationalism in history. Right? There are no fr first principles in history of which we can unfold all of history in some rational fashion. You have various actors acting for various reasons at various times under various circumstances. So the real question needs to be, what purges when and for why? And then second, under what instances, when you are faced with a giant military fascist threat, is purging your officer corps an easy way out? In fact, that seems like one of the most difficult things to do. Um, so uh, the notion of facile, the facile notion that all violence is equivalent, I don't agree with. And in this case, the violence of blowing up a supermarket so people realize that Walmart is exploitative is of a fundamentally, fundamentally different character than radically restructuring, violently restructuring your entire military apparatus in order to confront threats both internal and external. Well, and again, I follow. I can follow actually the Leninist thought pattern very closely up to a point. The violence, the need for violence to remove those generals, not the easiest way out in an ideal circumstance, but the concept of you know, the facile. It's tactically wise, and tactically wise, it doesn't matter whether whether or not it's the easiest route. It's not easy to keep in people who you think might betray you. Uh, even if it's not fun to restructure, the easy way out is using violence to purge rather than using a, a system to um, actually resolve things more fully as opposed to just using violence and basically lowering yourself to violence. Um, I'll take the next question. And if we want to pick that conversation up before that. Well, um, um, I, I think we might be mistaken also to, you know, you, you talk about, Rob, um, you talk about, you know, restructuring this violent prison system or, or, or the violent nature of these purges. And I don't wonder if maybe we're um, mistaken, right? We hear, we, all, we hear all these atrocious facts and accounts of, you know, um, the purges and, and being sent to the gulag, but I, I would I would guess that um, I would venture that taking into account you know the scale of what's taking place, if you look at if you look at the penal system in Russia during this time, I would say it's um, again taking into account the scale of it. I would say it's I, I would venture that it's more civil than anything taking place in America at the time or or elsewhere. And we, it's not like that time is free from atrocities everywhere. I mean, in America, we can assume that the capitalist state was, anyway, benevolent. They were throwing together all the Asians in their little West Coast places. So, and but you'll, I don't think comparison warrants of justification or, or morality. Okay, I, I guess really then to me, like to be more bold, I would say it, it's, it was one of the most. I mean, perhaps the most civil penal system existing at that time. Well, again, comparison and morality are two entirely different things. Saying that it's better uh, than things that are shit doesn't mean anything. You know, you, you're, you're right, you're right. I'm, I guess what I'm saying is, uh, I, I would say you would have to show how how it is immoral, or, but right? I, I need to do more research. I'm more questioning than trying to think. 
Uh, I'm going to just make this final response and then kind of withdraw this conversation at the same time. But I mean, this is this is I think where no offense, this, where your historic uh, your lack of historical knowledge sh shows through quite brilliantly. Um, plenty of generals were killed. Um, a significant amount of the general staff. By the way, ten generals killed in a general staff is a huge amount of generals, right? Um, so there were a significant number of generals killed. Also, there were a significant number of generals exiled to Siberia. Also, there were a significant number of generals and officers and army units that were put back into action, even though they had a questionable status in World War II. Right? So when you say, well, it seems easier to keep these people around you know, and deal with them even though they had questionable loyalty, well, which people? There were some that that was done for. There were some that were left in place. There were some that were just watched to make sure they didn't do. And then there were some that were executed. And the reasons why any particular general was exiled, executed, or left alone are historically contingent on that particular general. And so in order, I think, to have a fruitful discussion about it, you would need to bring up which particular generals and why their particular status was unjust or unfair. Does that make sense? You previously recommended the Black Book of Communism for further research into that. Would that cover something like this? or that No. The Black Book of Communism is uh, demographic porn. Okay. Um, it's basically trying to add up the murders, even if it has to use somewhat sketchy um, statistics, up to, uh, I think it's 100 million deaths. And so there are little individual stories. But what you really should look up is Histories of the Red Army. Histories of the Red Army. Um, that's not the title of the of book, but there are numerous titles of the book. Uh, uh, the title, or there are numerous books on the history of the Red Army, and most of those would be able to give you a better idea of what's going on. Any one you correct about? You know, I'll be honest, most of my knowledge from the Red Army either comes from primary sources, which are historically unreliable, or um, they come from World War II. There's a little bit done with the purges in World War II. Um, Michael glances when Titans clash, which is the best English language version of the Eastern Front. Um, but more than that, I would highly recommend talking to Kat Brown. If she can't tell you, she can probably direct you somewhere on where they could tell you. So she's in the history department here. So. Um, does anybody have any further questions? Anything else they'd like to bring up? Uh, there. <coughs> Okay, uh, there's no further questions. Uh, thank you for your time.